So the Maui New Marine Resource Council is a 12-year-old uh, organization. We became a nonprofit five or six years ago, and we are uh, uh, busy working on whatever we can think of to help protect the nearshore waters of Maui, to make sure that the waters are clean, the fish are abundant, and the coral is healthy. We're a community organization. We try, we try to draw our support from all across Maui Nui, from all sectors of Maui Nui, from the scientists to the environmentalists to the students to the uh, recreation industry to the visitor industry. Everyone needs to be involved and be a partner in helping us figure out how we protect this, this very precious resource. Um, this year we had a great partnership with the Maui Visitors Bureau uh, the, the County of Maui and the Hawaii Tourism Authority to help us get the word out on a variety of subjects, in particular sunscreen, and how we all need to adjust our sunscreen use practices to protect our coral because the use of sunscreens with oxy oxybenzone or octanoxate can, is very damaging to coral reproduction. And we all need to, to educate ourselves on and not use those, those sunscreens and use the ones that are made from titanium and zinc, which are much less damaging. Not, not, they're not safe, but they're less damaging to our waters than, than the conventional ones. Um, we also put up some really cool new signs at the airport to help educate our visitors and remind everybody else about good practices in the water, whether it's sunscreen, whether it's how to, how to interact or not interact with coral, and so on. If, as you go through the airport, please, please take note of them. They're very colorful, very easy to read, very, very user-friendly. And again, we did this with the help of our partners in the, in the visitor industry. Um, beyond that, we have another program where we test for, for the quality of our water here on Maui. Um, this year, we expanded our program. We're now doing testing using digital sensors, which is a first for us, uh, in particular, uh, initially in Mount Elia Harbor, where we're about to do our oyster project. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and we're also doing uh, sampling via boats. We're getting out and doing a, a complete circumference of the island of Maui, testing, testing the water quality across, around the entire island. And that's in addition to the program we've been going on for, for quite a while, where we test 41 sites on the leeward shore of Maui for 13 different indicators uh, of water quality. This is a volunteer-run program. We have 35 or so volunteers who help us test water quality every, every three weeks at these various sites. We've been doing this for several years now, and we've now got a, a solid baseline, which is full of bad news. Essentially, every site that we test is in violation of state standards for water quality. Every one. That insight has led us to start thinking about what's causing those problems and what we can do about it. It's led us to look up the hill from the ocean. And this is a, this is a, a in order to help us with our oyster project. We've, we're going to be putting our first test group of oysters in the water, we hope this month, this month of January, after a long period of, of science assessment, of getting very complicated permits from the state and other agencies. And we're gonna be using, putting our oysters in these cages and suspending them from the very, very, at various points in the harbor. Now, if they survive, we don't know whether they're going to survive at this point, the water quality may or may not be good enough for that. But if they survive, then we'll be expanding our program over the coming months and uh, adding additional oysters because they're going in the water so that we can use them to clean up the water in the harbor. How about that? They're, these are not food, at least not initially. These are oysters to help us clean up the harbor. A mature oyster can clean up as many as 40 gallons of water per day. They filter out all kinds of toxic materials and other materials so that we, uh, they, there are garbage collectors in the ocean. And if, we, if we're lucky and we're able to get a lot, of, a lot of them in there, we may be able to make a material difference in the water quality of that harbor. But that's not enough. So uh, uh, not long ago, we, we, we've sponsored a consulting project to figure out how we can keep things out of the water that's going into the harbor in the bay. And we came up with a, pro with a program that we call our Vision for Poakea, which will allow us to uh, make a bunch of different improvements upslope from the, from the harbor and the, and the bay. Uh, we hope this, that this will help us reduce sediment. We all saw the fire that we had there a couple, uh, in November. And we all know that when we get a big storm, that dirt's going to come down the hill. There's only one place for it to go, and that's in our ocean. 
we are beginning to, uh, we just got funded uh, from the federal government and from the county of Maui uh, to begin working on fire management projects up there. And that's really the tip of the iceberg. As, as time passes and we, as we, and we get more funding, we need a lot more funding to do this, we're hoping that we can do other projects there which will help us reduce sediment flow coming down the hill and, and going into our ocean. If we can do it in Ma'alaya, we, perhaps we can use that as a model for doing it around the rest of our islands. So doing all these projects is, costs a lot of money. And one of our key funding sources, I'm looking at them right now. And I want to thank you all for the support that you've given us over the years. It's critically important to us to have local support. That, that encourages our, our other funders to stay with us, and it shows them that we are, we are not only doing things at an academic level, we're doing things on the ground that people care about and people respond to and, and find to be important. So we really appreciate your support. Okay, I'm putting myself to sleep here. So let me, let's get on and we'll talk about um, uh, our, our presentation tonight. So Dwayne Sparkman. Dwayne is, uh, I think, the Assistant Director of Engineering at the Western Kanapali. He just got promoted this last week, so give him, give him a round of applause. Dwayne's been a resident of Maui since 1995. Uh, his life's passion is to pr preserve intact Hawaiian forest and perpetuate Hawaiian culture. He's a professional landscaper by trade um, and works on projects, but also works on projects within Haleakala National Park uh, uh, and, around, and around the island. He, has a, uh, he will offer us tonight a wealth of practical firsthand experience about what works to control pests and weeds based on years of experience uh, designing and working on luxury, luxury properties, private residence, the park, and, um, uh, and at the Maui, at the Westin, sorry. Um, when he's not working or volunteering his time with various Hawaiian reforestation projects, he enjoys spending time with his wife, Erin, and two children, Evan and Isabella. I think they might be up here tonight. Thank you for coming. We can all use your support. Uh, and please welcome me, join me in welcoming Dwayne Sparkman. <clears throat> Hello. I just got to get some stuff set up real quick, and we'll be good to go here in a minute. Okay. All right, I'm all mic'd up. I think I should be good to go. All right. I believe so. Oh, uh oh, watch out. Okay. Everybody can hear me. All right, good. All right, so that that's me. Um, you can see my son up there. He's on the hokulea. Um, so I'm really into Maui because I came here and fell in love. Um, not only with my wife, but the islands. Yeah. And so with that, you want to get up in the mountains and find out what's up there. Originally, I came here as an astrophysicist. I was going to school at the University of uh, Texas as an astronomy you know, major and decided I want to move to Maui. And I did. I bought a one-way ticket and never went home. And it happens. A lot of people do that. Um, but I really want to make a big impact while I'm here. So while doing that, I went to all these cool places. I worked for Haleakala National Park for a while. I got to fly by helicopter and go up to really crazy places up in Kipuhulu and put chemistry in the soil if we had to, but tried not to. You know, um, unfortunately, it's a big, actually, all right, I can hear that. Somebody's phone's ringing. Please, if you can all go to vibrate right now. Um, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, no, but this is a really important place to me is this area working here anywhere on this island. It's just great mana as we know what that is. So that's where I work. That's, that's the 12 acres I take care of. And I only take care of 12 acres right now. Um, I just recently picked up some work with DT Fleming Arboretum and now I have another 20 acres that I work with as a con conservancy group up in Ulupalakua Ranch. Um, this is uh, my home base, I guess you could say, or ground zero for me going organic in the industry. Oh, sorry, I'm not talking loud enough, sorry. Might not be on? Hold on. Some people say, oh, I'm going to go back. It's a little private. So, hold on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> the other one? Okay, let's see. Double mic. Yeah, I am. I've got sorry. two of them on here. Sorry. It's confusing. All right, try that. How's that? Oh, gosh. That's much better. I can hear me now. All right, I'm going to turn that off. Just kidding. No, I'm okay. All right, cool. Thanks. So um, this place allowed me to do some really cool stuff and kind of change how we do industrial landscaping, right? Because 
we've always been told you're supposed to use these really crazy pellets called fertilizer, and you have to do it every three months, and if you don't, plants look bad. Well, they're right. If you keep doing that, the plants look bad every three months. And then you have to do it over and over and over again. You can't stop because the plants look bad every three months. It's crazy. You don't have to do that. The first thing I did was stop. Stop doing all of our inputs. We don't do any fertilizing at all. That place is only compost. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, now we do chicken manure. Yeah, they can't smell too bad because we have the public to deal with, right? So we do that. We do pelletized chicken manure. Um, but this is what we're talking about. You can change the industry. The industry right now says that that place is required to have so much pesticides and herbicides on it that that's the only way it'll work. No, it's not. Go walk it. Please, I invite you to go walk my property. It's pretty impressive when you look at it and you go, wow, they don't really do that stuff here? They don't have to put diazinon out? You don't have to put all these crazy chemicals in the ground? No, you don't. You really don't. So, uh, please, I invite you to come see this. Make sure it's, all right, so, next one. So, at the Westin, we have, sorry, my bad, we have this thing called the Weston Watermill. And what they do is we bring a local celebrity. This is Zane Schweitzer. He's our original Weston Waterman. He's, a, I think, four-time world champion surfer. So he's really high up there. And so he brings that celebrity level. So we bring him to the property, and we have little sifting things, and we sift sand and pull microplastics out of the sand and teach kids how to clean up the beaches. And the kids are bringing the parents down in the morning. Here, clean the beach. And the parents are like, no, I want a Mai Tai. And, but that's fine. Have your Mai Tai, but let your kids clean the beach. Right on, good job. So it's really kind of cool seeing the kids come out influencing their parents to do the right thing. That's what we want to do. The younger generation are the ones that are going to set the next precedent. So you get them into it, and they're going to tell us how to fix it. So let's get them all started. Zane's really into it, and he's been our, kind of our champion for this in the beginning. Um, we now have... Oh, sorry, my bad, this way. We have a Western Water woman. Okay, this is um, Susie Cooney. She is a world champion uh, paddleboarder as well, and she's also a trainer. So she trains people. So if you want to learn really well how to do stand-up paddle, call Susie Cooney. She's awesome. Um, but she does the same thing, comes out, we walk the property, we look at that. But the whole point is to teach sustainability. So I do have some stuff here. We're going to do Q&A later, so we're going to have some questions I'm going to ask, and if you get it right, you get some swag. So kind of cool. So. All right, so we'll move on. Um, these are the associations I've worked with. Um, paid, non-paid, volunteer, you name it, we've done it all. So you can look at the handful of there. Um, this one here, I think this works. Yeah, look right there. That's where I'm working now with the Fleming Arboretum. We're doing some experiments with organic inside of the, the conservancy side, trying to get the conservancy folks into organics. It's really, really hard. The companies don't even do trials like this. You know, trying to take an organic herbicide and use it for cut stump applications. They didn't even think of trying that, so I'm doing it and sending them the information because I have a place that'll let me do it. So that's the cool thing about the relationships I'm building with the community is we're trying to get these things out of our watershed, right? We all drink water. You don't want this stuff in your water. Um, you can see up here, that's Art Medeiros' group. They're up there planting Oahe, getting the forest in Oahe to start making another watershed to bring water down to Kiikinui. So it's really cool replanting and putting that back. So it's really important. My cultural land, oh, my bad. My Maui cultural land's here. I sit in a volunteer group. They're, I'm part of the board of directors with those guys. Uh, we do cultural work, um, Honokawai Valley, the wind farm on the west side, Akumehame, as well as Launiapoko. So we have a handful of lo'ikalo that we take care of, and we take care of the summit up above the wind farm. So it's a very interesting place we get to go. It's where I get my, you know, I guess, my recharging. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we'll get past all of this. We'll get to the meat and bones of this. You see this here? This is the Landscaper's Pledge. This is the first thing that I got from right there, West Maui Kumuai, that said, am I doing the right thing? And you guys can read this off if you like, or well, I'll see if I can print some of these off. I'm sure the Kumuai has them. But this is a great way to start. You can take pictures if you want to take a picture of this and start trying to check these off, see if you're doing these things. If you're doing these things, you're doing the right things to protect the reef. This is the list that we go through. And when you get to a certain point and you have enough of these checked off, you get a nice little placard that you get to put at your hotel and say, I'm a good person. You, know, you gotta do that. You know, we're doing the right thing, yeah? You know, these big corporations aren't necessarily monsters. They're here, but we have to utilize that, 
right? So we have to be stewards of our land and let, let us do this, okay? So you guys got pictures? Everybody's good? So you're taking pictures? You're good? All right, you're good? All right, cool. Moving on. All right, so interestingly enough, the state has done some tests, water quality tests. I believe this one here is the statewide pesticide sampling pilot project. They went and checked a whole bunch of waterways beneath bridges around the entire state. And what did they find? All of that. Those are all, let's see, I think the top ones are uh, fungicides, the middle one green is herbicide, and the bottom is pesticides. Okay, all of these, some, uh, sorry, restricted pesticides. Restricted, and they're finding these in the water. And this is from a number of waterways underneath the bridges that go right into the ocean, okay? And it's scary, that's over 60 different types of chemis chemicals that they found. And it's, now this is not at dangerous levels, okay? But it just proves that they exist in the soil still years and years and years after they've been used. So pretty scary. Um, these are available on the internet. This is public knowledge, you can get this right off the internet, UH study, public information. So anybody can get this. Um, let's see, next one. So there's also this one that UH did. This is the actual <laughs> how glyphosate reacts to sea life and sea organisms, okay? And it's scary because right up in here, it talks about 91-day half-life in freshwater. It talks about 310 days in, marine, in um, ocean water, seawater, 310 days. That's almost a year that glyphosate is still active in ocean water. So this thing about dissipating in 72 hours is a perfect scenario. Nature's not perfect. It never happens. So this stuff still exists in the soil, ends up in the water, okay? Um, these are a lot of the things that people are using nowadays. You can see things like um, Merit right there. Cortec is a type of Merit, Safari. These are all systemic neonicotinoids. I'm sure people are aware of neonics. They've heard about these things, talking about possibly creating uh, bee colony collapse, thinking that these nicotines can work their way through the pollen and cause issues to bees and cause them to be kind of drunk and not make it back to their homes. So these are some of the ones we try not to use or try to absolutely stay away from. They were actually banned in any um, state um, area within Hawaii. They're not allowed to use these in, in state lands. The state's already banned them, so it's pretty interesting that that's already happened. Um, as a troll, this is a neem-based product. Now, in my industry, I have to use things that are for resort use. They have to have the labeling on there. It's very strict. I can get audited by the Department of Health and Department of Ag if I don't have the right things. So I have to have these things that are for resort use. So I cannot use 100% pure neem oil. They don't make a for resort use 100% pure neem oil. I have to use a derivative, which is called azatrol or azatin, azamax. Things that have the very first AZA, that is a neem derivative, okay? It works as a contact killer. You put it, you spray it right on top of your plants. It kills white fly, mealybug, aphids, anything soft bodied, it gets rid of them. It doesn't do it the first time. It takes about three applications over a month. You do it once a week. You do them early in the morning. If you do them too late in the afternoon, you're gonna have, uh, your, your plant actually starts to deform and get smaller because these oils will magnify the sun and dwarf the plant. So that's why they always say on the labels, spray before a certain time in the morning. You wanna be, before the sun even comes up, that's when you wanna be out spraying this stuff. It's also when the things are active. So you can actually get them, okay? So it's really important to, that's what I've switched over to. I only use neem. Uh, the best thing about it is bugs cannot build uh, an immunity to it, okay? So you don't have to switch back and forth between things. I know that back in the day it was like diazinon and, and uh, it's, uh, anyway, I don't wanna have to talk about the stuff you have to go back and forth because these bugs build an immunity after a few months and all of a sudden you spray it, it doesn't do anything. And you have to get another product and spray it. And then a the month later it doesn't work and then you do it again. So we <laughs> neem oils naturally derived from a plant that comes from India. It's an oil, like almost like cedar, and you spray it on top of your plants. The best part about it, in 100% pure, it's a systemic. It is a fungicide. It helps with bacterial growth. It promotes life in the tree. So neem is like the plan B tree. 
you have a fruit tree and you have a neem tree. And that neem tree will drop its leaf litter and support the growth of those trees around it. A lot of farms are doing that throughout the world. They're doing avocado, neem, avocado, neem. And neem trees feed the whole system. You want that whole system to work. And it's about keeping the microbes together, right? So, safe chemicals, right? My whole thing is follow the labels. Sorry, follow the labels as best you can. I think the most interesting thing is working with the company that makes Avenger citric acid. Um, they're promoting use more. They hardly ever do you have a, you know, unsafe levels. That, it's a citric acid. They don't have a problem with too much of this. You can't over apply this citric acid. It's like orange juice. You don't really got to worry about it too much. Microbes actually consume it. It's gone. It works its way out of the soil because microbes eat it, process it, and get rid of it. So for us, it's kind of a yay situation where we can you know, increase the volume in your percentages as you do batches, and you can take care of harder plants, harder target species. Like, for instance, if I was to spray a regular hibiscus, I would do like an 8 ounce per gallon mix. But if I'm going to spray cane grass, I'm going to do like almost 15 ounces a gallon almost double the amount because the action and how it works, okay? So, right here, we have one called Scythe. You can see this is made by Dow, okay? But it is derived from an organic plant. And it's from a geranium, and it's pretty neat. It's a perlagonic acid, and perlagonic acid actually can be derived from milk fats. So when you hear about Korean farming and people making things from milk fats, they're making pesticides and herbicides out of milk fats. So pretty interesting. And so these are derived from the fatty acid from a geranium, and they get a perlagonic acid out of it. It's a burn down mechanism. That means that you spray this product on top of the plant till it drips. And what it does is it strips that wax right off the leaf and the plant dehydrates. It's not a fast action. Okay, this one here has a really good efficacy in the sense that it's, it, it works really fast. So you'll see it within maybe three to four hours, you'll see that plant to start to burn down. And, and by the end of the day, that plant's gone. Um, and it, it's the best thing we've come across in a long time. So super handy. So this is a good one to get. Um, they do have it at Simplot. You can buy this on the regular. So it's called Scythe. Takes anything. Um, but like I, talk, I talked about, they have different amounts you put in according to your target species. And what that has to do with is cuticle thickness or fur. So tomentum on a plant suspends that water droplet off that cuticle. And so you've got to spray it so much that it finally saturates through the hair and burns that cuticle off. Cane grass, you know when you get that on you? All that fiberglass? That stuff, it, it, makes, it kind of sheds that liquid off. So you've really got to soak cane grass heavy. Yeah, I, I do experiments in the backyard. So, um, so that's... Avenger. So this, that's what I was talking about. This is Avenger. This one here is a citric acid uh, made out of, um, from Georgia. And these guys actually work with Florida, getting all the lemons and limes and oranges from the industry, and they crush it down and make limonene oil. And this is what we go out and apply. Um, it works really well. There's a new product. I don't even know if it's here yet. I'm working with it right now. It's called Avenger Optima. It's a more refined oil. Um, this one here is a brown, smells like oranges. You open, you're like, ooh, it smells good. You smell, you spray your yard, you're like, oh, this is awesome. It's not like that chemical. You're like, oh my God, it's terrible. You can spray this, and your neighbors are like, well, what'd you put out? You're like, oh yeah, yeah, little incense burning. No, it's actually just the Avenger. I went and sprayed my yard. So it's pretty neat. Um, I've spilled this directly on my hands, 100% concentration, no burns, no issues, no problems. Um, I'm doing cut stump applications with this right now, burning, um, uh, what do you call it, halikoa, cutting it and pouring it on top and letting it just burn right down the root. And it's, it's working. It's actually kind of working. I'm really stoked to see that product working. They didn't try it, so they've got to go through the whole trials process, and that changes the label. There's a whole bunch of things they've got to go through to get that, a bunch of money, basically, to get that on the label to become something we can use in the forestry industry. Okay, so eventually it's going to get there. It's going to be years before it gets there, but at least we're trying to start. Um, this is the Avenger Optima, and we're hoping to have this on the market here on Maui pretty soon. Um, you can check with BEI. I'm pretty sure BEI already has it at, uh, on Oahu in the Big Island. They were bringing that stuff in because State Department of Transportation and the schools have been asking for it um, since we've gone through a school ban of herbicide. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but this one works better. You can see it's actually a 55% concentration of delimiting oil. So that citric acid in itself can burn stuff down. Yeah. And it's, like I said, it smells great. You know, it's 
really actually nice. But yeah, take pictures, please, yeah, if you can. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, so this right here, um, you can see this plant right here, this right here, this is a papala tree, which is a pretty rare Hawaiian species, that's this tree here. And we have this hibiscus plant, it's, like it's not even a hibiscus, I take it back. Um, we call them tree daisies, They're these giant trees, they have beautiful daisies on, they have beautiful daisies on top, they're gorgeous, right? But anyway, they're not native and we gotta get rid of them. So we cut them down and as opposed to having to spray the whole area with chemistry to try to melt this plant down, I was like, let's just try to cut the stump and do a basal application of Avenger Optima. And so I just, there's one month, you know, on, in no, November, there's a cut and here it is literally 28 days later. Same plant, um, burned completely down. All the foliage fell off and it's burned all the way down. And that was a tablespoon of Avenger Optima, just poured right under the stump. So it works. Um, it, it, this is a very soft uh, tissued species, so I knew it would work on this material because it's soft. But like things like Chiave, things it's very hard cuticle, hard to burn. So a little bit different action there. Um, you can see here, I actually cut into the stump and you can see how dead the thing is. So within 28 days, it killed it all the way to the root. So one good thing is it had zero effect on this papala tree right here. That's the species we want to keep, right? Had I done this with Roundup, you run the risk of getting that in the soil, and this tree here turns yellow, defoliates, and you're praying that it comes back alive. You just hope it does. And so it's just a matter of paying attention to this stuff. So um, as a troll, so this is one I was talking about earlier. Take photos of this one. Um, this is a good one. I've been using this for many, many years, but like I said, there's also as a max and as a tin. Those also work as well. They're neem derivatives. Um, that's basically they took the active piece out of the neem that they feel is the most important part and used it. Now, like I said, if you, you guys as homeowners, go buy 100% neem oil. If you can get it, get it. The highest concentration of neem oil you can get, use it. That stuff is like that you can spray it literally on the soil around the base of the plant and get rid of things in the soil like root knot nematodes. You, you can move ants with it. It's, yeah, I'm, seriously, there's a lot of stuff you can use with this neem oil. It's, it, and it does not smell like oranges. It smells like rotting onions. Sorry, my wife's back there going, yes. It's, it, it does, it does not smell good. But it, it's safe, okay? It's, it, that's the best part is it doesn't smell good, but it's safe, okay? So, but if you can get 100% neem oil, use it. Yes, please use neem oil. And I think that's the next one right here. This uh, Dynagro is 100%. They actually call it leaf polish. That gets it in the industry, right? But it's actually better if you use it for other things. Um, you can do drenches. It'll absorb through the plant material. You can spray it on top of the plant. There's a number of things. You have fungus problems on the plant. Spray the plant down. It gets rid of the fungus and the mildew. There's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with just neem oil applications. They also make neem cake fertilizer, where they have the neem mixed up in the fertilizer and the plant uptakes it and fights the bugs. So it's, it's really, really great product. So there's a lot of different things you can do with neem oil. Um, this one here is one you can buy um, like at Ace Hardware. It's like a 76%. I think that's the highest one you get from Ace. So I just put that on there because that's probably the one you're gonna see the most often. Um, but like I said right here, fungicide, miticide, and a systemic. So it fights a lot of different things organically. These things do not build up tolerance to this. Okay, they can't, they can't change, they can't get used to it. That's the best part. What it does is it basically makes the bug so out of its mind it forgets to eat and it starves to death. That's literally the mode of action. It just makes it crazy. So yeah, pretty funny. I, I mean, I, I don't eat neem, I'm, I'm okay. Okay, so composting, okay? We've got to work on getting Maui a good composting system. We have one of the best ones right now, but that doesn't mean it's permanent. From what I've heard, Maui ecosystems might have two years left here because they're switching over management of the Maui County landfill. Okay? So, and I don't know to who, but that's one of the situations we're gonna have to deal with is these guys might not be here very much longer. They're working on trying to get permits on Amaron property, but they're working on it, okay? It doesn't mean it's gonna happen. Um, this is one of the best products I can find for non-edible plants. And I say non-edible because this right here does have 25% sewer sludge from all of us in it. That is sustainable. We have to look at it like that. We have fecal matter we gotta use let the grass have it. You know what I mean? We don't got to put it on food to eat, but we can give it to the lawn. You know what I mean? Give it to the palms, go right ahead. 
and it's organic material. You know, sure, there's probably you know, pharmaceuticals and all this stuff in super micro levels, but you know what? It's not going to bother the grass. I don't think the grass is going to get worried about that. But we've got to do something with that sewer sludge. So they utilize it, 25% of it goes into their compost, and it is turned into compost. It heats up to a level to where it burns all the bad stuff out. I get the soil reports from these guys a month in advance because they have to give it to the EPA before they can release it to my property. So I get to see what's in the soil. I know what's in there. I've seen everything that's in there, carcinogenic, all that stuff. Very, very low counts, minimals of anything. Some negligible numbers. So like I said, ornamentals. Lawns, palms, things you know you're not going to eat. Okay, you don't put this on basil. Okay? You can put it on bananas. You can put it on mango trees, avocado trees. It takes years for that stuff to filter through the system. But a plant like basil, herbs like that, that's too quick. You don't want this stuff around it. So I recommend getting some inoculated soils. They have nice organic inoculated soil you can use. Really good stuff. Inoculated means it's got good fungal rhizomes in it. Mycorrhizal fungus. Um, mycorrhizal fungus is something that's so important to our system that we don't see. Everybody sees the plant on top and the plant looks great. But if that fungus and that bacteria down there is not working, that tree is going to start changing a lot faster than you think. And that's when you go grab fertilizer and you throw it on there and the thing looks green again. All right, that works. No, no the system is still collapsing. Okay, so our whole thing is to try to build that up, get those nutrients back up. So that's where you put in the material for the bugs to eat, the microbes to eat. That's the compost. It goes in. And then we have these organic fertilizer possibilities, right? And what we're looking for is, right here is very critical. You see this water insoluble nitrogen? You guys ever heard of that? Probably not, right? That's the worst thing I can hear. You guys gotta know about water insoluble nitrogen. That's really the only way plants take up nitrogen. Not through water. It's through a mechanism of different things eating and releasing the material so the plant can take it up into the root system. Water releases a little bit of it, but not the real meat and potatoes of the situation, okay? So water-soluble nitrogen goes in your ocean, feeds all the algae out there. That's why we have so much problems on our reefs, is everybody's pushing water-soluble nitrogen. And we have irrigation that runs too long, and we have huge storms that bring it all down, and you wonder why you have huge algal blooms across the entire situation of Lahaina. You look up there and you go, that golf course. Okay? It's all water and soluble nitrogen. It's all of us that live in the neighborhoods saying, oh, this is what NPK told me to do. NPK said nitrogen, slow release. Yeah, that's great, but make it water and soluble nitrogen. That's even better. Right? Because that's what's in compost, water and soluble nitrogen. That's what, the, that's what naturally happens, is water insoluble nitrogen. We made water-soluble nitrogen because we thought it would get there quicker. And yeah, it does. It gets there and everywhere else. It, it goes everywhere else. Okay? You put this much regular NPK on a plant, it takes up maybe the thumb worth, and the rest goes everywhere else. The plant can only take up so much. And you've got to look at your plant size and understand how much to put on that plant because of its uptake value. Same thing with herbicides. The worst thing as a homeowner we can do is go, more is better. If I put more of this down, I don't got to spray it three weeks later. Well, yeah, you killed everything. <laughs> you're going to go try to plant a tree back there. It's going to turn yellow. You're going to wonder, why did I do that? Or why is, this, why is it turning yellow? You're going to get mad at the landscaper. That's all the chemistry that went down there. It, it, it happens. It stays in the soil for a long duration. These plants are very sensitive to it. Yeah? So we really got to pay attention to those things. So smart irrigation is also key. Okay, and I say smart irrigation, you guys can be the smart part of the irrigation. Okay, a lot of people ask me about nutgrass. How do you handle nutgrass? You have to use herbicide on nutgrass. No, you don't. Turn the water off. It's literally that easy. And I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I watch it in my yard. I've seen nutgrass come up, and I stopped watering the area. And my native plants are like, oh, dude, thank you. It's about time. And then nutgrass literally disappears. Nutgrass is activated when the water goes down eight inches in the soil level. Eight inches, right? Most plants only need about an inch and a half. That's all they really need. Grass needs a third of an inch a day. A third of an inch, okay? If you're putting eight inches of water, yeah, you're going to have nutgrass. That means you have a low spot, you have poor drainage, you have a water leak. You can fix all of those. 
Seriously, that's the funny part about nut grass. And everybody's like, no, you have to use chemistry. No, you don't. It's methodology. You change how you manage these things. I'm noticing it at the hotel that I'm getting nut grass growing in a certain area, and what do I find? The sprinkler head shoots right into the naupaka bushes and it drops all right there. That's where the nut grass grows. Well, cool, let's just shave that down a little bit more, put a higher arcing head over the bush, nut grass goes away. Amazing. It's really that simple. Nut grass grows in heavy duty water bogs. It likes to sit in water. That's the only thing that activates it. Don't activate it. If you have a situation where you have to have an area where you just have to have it wet and it's active, excavate. Go down eight to 10 inches and remove all those little tiny nuts out of the soil and re-put that soil back and you've just eliminated your, your situation. So there are many organic ways, but it has to be with methodology and sometimes you're back. You have to actually cut stuff down and dig things out. There is no way around it sometimes, and sometimes it costs money if you can't do it yourself. So just think about that. So um, this is what I use is weather track. This actually pulls satellite data from a number of different weather stations throughout the entire state. It tells me what my evapotranspiration should be for the day and waters accordingly. And that's depending on the parameters that I set on my slope, how much plant material and what that plant material needs per day. I put that in that little autonomous robot, and that robot spits out a program and does what it does. It's amazing. I didn't believe in it when I first started it, and then I just kind of let it do its thing. <laughs> wow. It's really, really neat. These plants don't need as much as what we are thinking they do. Humans have a tendency to overdo it. Orchids are the best thing. How many people grow orchids here? What's the best thing you can do? Leave it alone. That's what I've noticed. Don't, don't mess with it too much. It likes a little bit of love, but if you give it too much, then that thing just, oh, what happened? I died. So it just, it, orchids are great. The, I find that you neglect them, they're like, thanks, dude. <laughs> Put them up in a tree, and it's like, right on, brother, flowers. Leave me alone, I'm doing my thing. And that's what, the cool thing about these native plants, too. They're about that, too. They don't like maintenance. They really don't. I, trust me, I've worked in the forest a lot. It's really hard to get a native plant to work inside of a resort, and it look good. I'm serious. Um, I'm sorry, but no offense. We have Ali'i trees. You can't trim them. They're little princesses. Don't trim those. If you trim it, the thing will die. And I get them specced in at properties. Oh, put a whole hedge. We're going to have a square box hedge of Ali'i in here. Oh, no, you're not. You will for the first three months, and they're all going to die. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's inevitable, but it's how you work with the plant material, right? So that's our whole thing is to really work with native species. Um, this is still part of our water usage report. You can see that I'm staying in the green. I got a nice score of 98, right? But unfortunately, right here in 2016, we went under renovation and these numbers went way up, like way over here because, <laughs> so, so that's why I cut that off. Um, but uh, I kind of had to, it's kind of messed up data. Uh, but that was really because of renovation. They had to use a lot of water for dust control. We were draining and filling ponds and it was just really obscene amount of water use. So, and it was out of my control. And that's all part of construction when you go through resort remodeling. So, storm drain filtration. This is key to stop material from going down into your ocean, okay? So in this, we decided to find an area that had a nice big storm drain. You can see it up there on the left. And we decided to accent it and put plants around it as, as identifiers of issues. So, dig them out, set our little wall around it, put in our gravel and our rocks. We came right back in here and we put in Carex wahuensis this is a na native species of sedge. Native species of sedge, nutgrass sedge, right? Because water, right? <laughs> so nutgrass grows in there. Hey, well, it looks like a sedge, right? It all matches. <laughs> About playing with the right plant material. So those plants there, if my company or anybody in that hotel puts a chemical down, it's going to go right through this group of plants right here and go into that drain. These plants right here will show me when it happened. And I can go back and say, what did you do? What did you put on here that's going to kill that plant? Because once you kill that plant, guaranteed it's going to go down and kill anything else right there in the ocean, because that goes right to our ocean. Those are storm drains. Okay? So you want to have little indicators, and plant material like this is perfect for indicators. They tell you when it's burned, and that can tell you when to go back and find out what went there. Okay? So it's really important to have those indicators. Um, you can see a couple more here. This is uki uki grass. This is a... Actually, we're the New Zealand version of uki uki grass uh, called Dianella variegata, and this is just regular aloe vera. Uh, but that's also the runoff here has to go through plant material to get to the drain, right? Because I want to see if my guys are using bad chemicals on that flagstone, because those touch the water. 
And that's, that's how we can stop it, okay? Um, you can see here, maybe kind of okay, you can see dirt makes dirty water, leaf material makes nice potassium-rich water, and lovely live material makes clean water. So this just kind of tells you, when you have a nice growing area, it filters all that material right out. So it's very important that we keep our watershed intact. Yeah. So um, these are some of my water-loving plants. We'll go through this really quick. Um, this right here grows up in um, Kanaha, in the pond there at Kanaha, very popular plant there, as well as this Sapresius here. Um, this is um, Ahu Ava, which they actually use to squeeze the Ava plant to make kava, so you can drink kava. They utilize those long runners right there and wrap it up and squeeze it. Ahu is the action to twist. So the Ahu Ava means to twist the kava, and that's what that plant's for. Um, these things, are, these are different species of cypress, um, um, actually blunt spike rush, and then we have from Breezy, this, this is a cool one, um, Mao Aki Aki. Have you ever seen, um, we call it Chinese pokey grass, but they call it emerald zoysia. It makes little mounds really pokey and stiff. This is one of those types of plants. It's very, very stiff, so don't sit on it. It'll go right through your clothes. Yeah, so be careful. Um, yeah, that Oahu sedge up top. Um, of course, Dianella sanguinensis, the uki uki berries make blue dye for Hawaiian um, tapa. And then we have things like the ie ie. And then, um, yeah, obviously, milo, lauhala, and kalo. So very important. Here's a big list of uh, native species as well that are low maintenance native species. Um, you don't have to do much to them, but also at the same time, you don't want to do much to them. They don't want you to do much to them. The more you do to them, they don't like it. <laughs> they really like to be left alone. That's how the native species work. So, um, and you can see we have photographs of them here, various species. Pohina hina is a great, actually that's, um, sorry, take that back. That's Akia uva ursi. That's the fish poison plant. So this plant can be actually crushed up and used to catch fish. It has a neurotoxin in it. Um, and uki uki berries, of course, um, obviously, kukui, um, lauhala, pandanus, or sorry, pandanus, prochardias. Um, we also have the, uh, what do you call it, pohina hina, which is a great sage. That's a great one for the oils. It smells really good, and you can make a tea out of it. It's a great flavored tea. Um, the flowers mixed with the berries make a dye, add kukui nut, and you have a permanent purple dye. So a very useful plant. Um, obviously, the osteomeles down here. This is a rose with no thorns. So this is our ule species that can be used for making um, uh, basically fishing net structures, things like that, so very handy, rosewood. Uh, oh yeah, and then we have a movie to watch, so if you guys don't mind, just sit back for a minute, enjoy this for a little bit, and I'll be back in just a second. Start going this route to become more organic and clean. 
we got invited to come along on this tour, you know, go island to island with Lee Johnson and say that we know the alternatives, and if the alternatives are available, why not use it? By switching over to the safer stuff, now my plants are so healthy, having healthy soil and healthy plant material. My own team, they are happier because they know what they're putting down is safe. They're not going to run the risks of having an issue of something that could be detrimental to their health in the future. When I see guests, I tell them that you're walking on the safest lawn you can be on in the whole stretch of Continental Poly. We don't use samples here. It really makes them feel good. And when their kids are out playing on that grass, it's not going to make them sick. And it's really leading a legacy of positive change. I see a lot of positive changes coming down the pipe through landscape. It's always in us to want to go up into the forest and recharge. So why can't it be the same as we're just looking down your lawn and recharge? I mean, it's the same type of thing. And so it's really trying to get the general public to see that there are easy alternatives to this chemistry that we've been working with for the past 20, 30 years. We had a big win with the Department of Education getting them to stop pesticides on their schools. That's a huge win for us. Kids no longer run risks of getting sick. That in itself is really ingenious. So this tour that we've had has just been nothing but good stuff. I was deeply struck by Wayne Lee Johnson's story, how he had got cancer from using pesticides. We're introducing an upcoming pesticide bill to protect families that use our county parks and also our workers. So currently, there's five county parks that are on a program that are not using any pesticides. As island people living in Hawaii and living in an island environment with limited resources, we're using pesticides to eventually leak into groundwater, our streams, into our oceans, and definitely affect our reefs. Pushing the pesticide bill really helped not just for public health, but for environmental health as well. So we definitely want to practice aloha aina, aloha aina, care and love for our land. And Hawaii is such a special place. It's not only in ground zero for industrial agriculture, but there's just so much that people can learn. I think that we're also seeing this cultural revitalization. People who want to get back into farming and who are getting more in touch with the land again. And so it's really cool to have Lee here to share his story and see him literally sharing a stage with activists that have been doing this work for so long, protecting natural resources in Hawaii. So it's pretty amazing. I'm so thankful. I'm just blown away by all the people, activists, nonprofits here that have pitched in. And whether it's a school or a park, everyone who uses that space has an incentive to want to take care of it. We're all exposed, whether it's in food or drinking water or we lay on this grass. It's part of our everyday lives, and so we just have to figure out a way to engage people in the right way. It's maybe that what they really care about is water, or they really care about farmers, or landscape architecture, and so let them run with that, and that can be their reason for wanting to start this. The more young people that you can bring into this that want to be engaged in something that's bigger than themselves, the better. It doesn't matter how old you are, and I think that we're seeing that all across the world now. We're the future, and we're the ones that are going to have to look at the consequences. If there's a problem, you can do something about it.
hope you enjoyed it. I hope you guys got a lot of information out of that. I really appreciate you guys coming. So does anybody have any questions? Anything that they're itching to, all right, we got one right there. Actually, you can, I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So, um, and you can reach me through the hotel. Um, the easiest way to get me is through Weston Maui, and then I can come out and do assessments. I do that on the side, so I, I really don't mind. I want to get, get the information out there for people, so yes, absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, you had mentioned using uh, uh, alcohol for long time in this case. Yes. There's no issue with children playing on the grass using that kind of uh, no, the particular product that we use is going to be a fine mix that actually has sand in it, and it's, a, it's super refined, so it's basically a powder. And so once we put it down, within seven days, it's gone. And when we do any of the applications we do, we actually cordon the area off. It's out of order. People do not use it while this compost is being soaked down into the grass layer. So, and it takes about seven days. It's a really amazing process to put. I mean, seriously, we will verticut our lawn in March, we verticut it, a couple passes. Verticutting is going through and dethatching, removing part of the thatch on the seashore. We remove basically 50% of the, of the rhizomes come out of that lawn, and we throw that away, right? Or give it away if people want lawns, you can use that as stolen. Um, another thing. Uh, but then we come back and we put in a nice layer of eco-compost right on top of that that is a blend of sand and compost, about a 70% 70, 70 soil, 30% sand blend fills in all the holes, makes it nice and level, and that grass just comes right up through it. And I only have to do it once a year. That's it, there's no fertilizer I gotta worry about. If I see an issue as I'm starting to get into the later part of the year and I'm seeing a lot of traffic on my lawn, I'm seeing kind of footpaths, things like that, and I wanna make sure that it'll aerate, then I'll go through and we'll, we'll aerate and we will fertilize in October, okay? And that's the early part because if you do anything beyond November, You've just thrown all that product in the ocean. The plants are not active. The plants go dormant. So what are we doing part of the year fertilizing during the winter months? It doesn't do anything. You literally just threw that away. The, plant, it, the plants aren't gonna uptake it. They're gonna store it if they can. So it's really about paying attention to it, but Eco's great for that. But that, like I said, little layer, fine material. Planters are another thing. Planters use 100% compost material. It has more big chunks in it and fits right in with the bark mulch that we use. Because we use the same bark mulch from those guys too. It's a very easy commodity to get and it's completely sustainable. It's recycled. Um, all my green waste from my hotel goes to Central Maui and turns into green waste and I bring it back. So it's a closed loop product. And same with the compost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do we, um I noticed that some of those products had a, I think it was an OR MI certification. Yes. Could you talk about what that means? Um, what is that assurance of? And are there any other certifications? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm, I kind of stick to the OMRI stuff because that's the most popular right now. Um, I'm not sure of any others. Um, I'm sure there are going to be more certifications out there. I know that Chip Osborne is working with the OLA, which is the Organic Landscape Organization, and they're trying to develop more areas that they can do that and become almost like an OMRI. Because what we're finding is, in some cases, OMRI's kinda almost too lenient and allows things in. Um, there are pyrethroids, which are synthetic pyrethrins that are showing up in OMRI certified products. So it's a little wishy-washy up there in federal government on what OMRI really stands for. So we've really gotta look at your ingredient package and see what exactly is in that material that you're putting out. And, and that's up to you guys to, to read about that stuff. You know what I mean? And that's, that's all I can say is that's what I did. You just read about it and you, you read what does that mechanism, what does that do? How does it actually work with the bug or work with the, you know, how does it actually physically work? And that's really the bigger pictures you want to look at. So, um, but OMRI certified, it's, it's a good standard right now. But like I said, I think it's getting a little wishy-washy up in government right now on how, what they're allowing in the OMRI certifications. I have, I have a couple here. You have? Um, I'm just wondering about like snails and slugs and all the advertisements. Is the slug safe? There are, there are the different types of iron. It's basically an iron. Uh, but the, in that, you also don't want to over iron. So it's really looking at what, what brings the slugs in. 
and it's usually super moist areas. They're hiding under damp material, material that's composting and rotting, things that shouldn't be there. So it's really working with your land and trying to remove those things that host those animals, right? That's the first thing to do. Second is to apply iron if you have to, and that's really the only organic alternative is to use iron on the plants, and that, that's basic, or on the uh, slugs, and that's what sluggo is. So there are some safety issues with it, but you, like I said, you don't want to use too much iron because that's going to cause problems in your soil. And on your slide where you had all the pesticides with azitrol, and then there was another one beneath it, and as is something else, it said it was not safe for the oceans? Is that that is, that's correct. So it, what it, it, it pulls the oxygen out of the water, and that's what it's referring to. It, that's exactly right. You, and there would be no, absolutely no reason to do that. And it also shouldn't be applied to any freshwater bodies either. Because like I said, if you apply it to a koi pond, for instance, you'll kill a handful of koi because it'll, it'll pull the oxygen right out of the water. And that, that's really what it comes down to. Does it get into the ocean when you spray it on your plants and soak them with it three times a month? Actually, no, and it depends on your ratios and what you're putting out your target species. So with that material, when you're using the correct amount of mixture and you apply it to your plant material, you actually stay there and it's dry within 30 to 45 minutes. So that, that material, unless you get a deluge and I spilled the entire bottle right next to the drain, that's when you're going to get that issue. But you're not going to get that from doing regular applications in your yard. Do you consider the presence or absence of earthworms in any way? I love the presence of earthworms. Earthworms are the best aeration system you can, got, you can get. Uh, worm castings are super good for your soil. It, when you see earthworms, you actually have a really well-balanced soil. And, and it's funny because people get freaked out when they see the little piles come up on the, like, no, don't get rid of that. That's a good thing. And it's seasonal. It's usually winter time and then it goes away. You don't got to worry about it. And I, I really laugh, they get really upset. Like my hotel gets really upset when they see that. But I've now changed the way they look at that. It's perception and how we look at things. You know, obviously you know that nature's not perfect. So when you see little earthworm mounds, that's, that's, we go out and aerate. We pay for that. They're doing it naturally. <laughs> I mean, like, seriously, so you see earthworms, it's a good thing. It's actually a really good thing. Yeah. Have you done a baseline uh, study of the impact that your practices are having on the reefs off of the West End? I would love to, but unfortunately my neighbors would ruin the test. There's, you know what I'm saying? I, like I said, I'm 12 acres. I have 750 linear feet of beachfront, and everybody else that doesn't do what I do has the rest. So that's the bigger picture is to get all of these resorts to kind of set mandates of this is what you are required to do now because we see that it works. Um, but you have to have every kind of, before I can take, do a test like that. Um, it would just be muddied by my neighbors, the whalers, and you know, next door at the LEE. It's just too close. I'd love to, though. What are you doing to encourage them to change their practices? Things like this. Uh, we also have Beyond Pesticides coming, I believe, in the end of February. And we're going to be holding another uh, public forum for Beyond Pesticides. Have you ever heard of Beyond Pesticides? They're out of Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, they've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, Chip Osborne has Osborne Organics. Um, and then we also have Jay Feldman, who's a soil scientist, and these, these guys bring a wealth of knowledge to the table. Um, they helped us with our county pilot project. So we have the soccer field in Kihei. We have the park in the back of the neighborhood in Paia. I think it's called Makana Park. We also have the uh, baseball field over at War Memorial Stadium and one called Luana Gardens on Papa Street that they no longer do any chemical inputs to. Uh, they found that just mowing this grass is acceptable, and it really is. Uh, when you walk around those properties, I, I walked it the other day with, um, you know, with kids and stuff. We go out there and check them out, and I came across a babysitting group. A bunch of moms get together, and they bring their kids out to this park. And I got to tell them that this is like an organic, safe park. How would you guys know? Oh, we didn't know. I'm like, <laughs> we come back because this is the best thing you can do is bring your kids to this park. There's no chemical inputs at all, and they were ecstatic. They were super happy just to hear that they don't got to worry about that. If their kid goes and eats that piece of grass, oh, cool, eat it, go ahead. Whatever, it's organic, dude, eat it, go ahead. It ain't going to matter. You know what I mean? You don't got to worry about it being tainted with anything. So, and, and that's the thing. We really, really are happy about that. The fifth park that they speak of in here is um, Waipuilani, 
You know where Waipulani Road is? It goes down, there's a county park on the end, I think it's Maui Sunset. That county park there, they do no inputs there either. Um, that's my friend Sonny that takes over uh, Maui Sunset. He takes care of that entire park and he doesn't do any inputs. It's all seashore past Balmy, lets the salt take care of everything. Um, and yes, I use salt to kill weeds. Go ahead. I have a uh, hibiscus, and like most people who have hibiscus, I have white flies. Yes. I use the D, and the white flies increase. I use the D again, and they still came around. In desperation, I use bear three and one. It killed the white flies, but only for about a week, and then they came back. Right. Girls, what am I doing now? You're growing the wrong plant in the wrong place. I'm sorry, but I gotta say it. I'm not, I'm totally serious, you guys. And, and I'm telling you, your plant is telling you something. Dude, I can't handle it. I, you know, I'm serious, and I, and I hate to say that, but I've killed thousands of plants myself by planting them in the wrong place. And it's just, it's the wrong place for that plant. And, and in some cases, hibiscus are the worst. They are hybrids, and they are weak. I, I hate to say that, but they're very finicky and they're hard to take care of. They will gall really fast. They'll get the first white fly, mealy bug, root knot, they'll get it first. Yeah, and you got to battle it from beginning to end. So what we have found is the use of native Hawaiian species are way stronger. They have a stronger DNA, they can handle better, and we're actually seeing the regeneration of these plants better. That's the only hibiscus I use on my property is a native hibiscus. That's the only one. Um, I do have a hedge of Chinese reds, but you never see the flowers because we're always trimming it into a square. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's got to do this, and you get all these beautiful flowers out of it. But by that time it happens, my boss is like, you have to trim that. So we never get a chance to actually see the flowers on the day. So hibiscus, I, I'm not a big fan of hibiscus because they, they bring them, they, they, they actually harbor them, and you have problems with hibiscus. They, they are not a big fan. But like I said, if you can use native, try to get a native white Arnadianus or a Waimea, and you'll be happy. They react really well because they, they're super strong plants. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yep. All right, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the echo for um, compost for not having a food um, I've been buying just inoculated bales of soil. Um, that's the best thing I can find, and I'm doing small raised gardens with it. Um, as far as using um, soil out, you know, large plots of soil, you can actually do it with amending, amending it with um, organic fertilizer. The, the, the wind fertilizers and your chicken manure fertilizers, you're better off taking the existing soil and churning it and adding in amendments to it and then growing in that existing soil. We're doing uh, That's right. And that, that's a tough one. I have no solid recommendation for you. We don't have a good, solid, organic material that I can get here in volumes that I can, that I can put my name on, okay? I can put my name on Eco. I've used that for years and have had no problems on the ornamental side. I am not a farmer, okay? I am a landscaper. So I do a little bit of farming on the side and I help people get their things started, but it's usually a little four by eight little plot, okay? <laughs> it's not that much. Yeah. How do you use salt if you worry about runoff? Um, well, you know, it, salt, we're surrounded by salt. I'm not that concerned about salt. I'm, I'm more worried about the salt buildup in the soil over time if you apply too much. That's really the bigger picture. We eat salt, we, we sweat salt. Um, we actually should be putting more salt back in our body on a daily basis and we don't. That's why we're really high acid, we should be more base. So there's a lot of issues with that. So I use salt on my seashore past phallum to kill weeds. I use it as a nutrient supplement on the, on the actual plant material because that plant derives from a Florida bog, a grass that was grown from Florida that came out of a bog from the ocean, and the guy threw it in his yard and started mowing it. It turned into a lawn. He's like, wow, cha-ching. And now he's got seashore past Balam around the world. We have these beautiful lawns, yeah? And you can water with salt water, brackish water, and put salt right on a weed and watch that weed dry up and the grass looks fine. It's amazing. So. It only works in full sun, so don't be going out and getting seashore and putting it underneath an avocado tree. It's going to die within a few weeks. So that's more for El Toro Zoisha. So, and El Toro Zoisha is fairly salt tolerant as well. You can get away with that too. So as a homeowner, use as much salt as you want. No, I take that back. Don't. Um, you want to use a little bit of salt, you know, maybe a teaspoon or tablespoon per active plant. I use it on crabgrass all the time. It kills it right to the root. Plant dies. So very easy to apply. You just put it out manually. Um, I don't mix it in water and try to spray. That does not work. You have to literally put the salt crystals on the plant so it pulls the moisture from the plant. It has to be a physical contact. 
Okay, we've tried a number of different experiments with it, so. But it, it works, it does work. Any other questions? Or did that help, was that enough? Uh, when using the yeah. yeah, there's no benefit to go stronger than the, the maximum, right? Absolutely not. You will only, it'll only uptake so much. You, it, n n never is more better when it comes to pesticides. Herbicides, in like these burn downs, that's what works. More is better depending on the target species. Okay, like, like a glycine is very furry. You're gonna have to use a higher amount of, of, of Avenger on that one, or Scythe, a higher mix ratio. But for neem oil, stick to the three quarters an ounce per gallon. That's all you're gonna need. But you're gonna do it on a weekly basis until your problem is solved. Yeah. As you're trying to make some changes out in kind of pollen, have you been able to demonstrate a change? It's what will talk to the resorts is whether or not there's cost effectiveness to this. Yes, correct. It's changing. So are you able to show more than good intentions but actual benefit? I, I would say that I haven't, I haven't increased my budget. I've been able to massage what I do, okay? So you'll notice if you go to my hotel, you will never see 300 square feet of impatient flowers. You're not gonna see that. I don't do that. It's a waste of materials, a waste of my money, okay? I'm gonna concentrate on organic applications. I'm gonna do something right for the property. If you notice, if you go to my property and notice, we're doing a lot of fern, we're doing a lot of really indigenous species now because we now have a sense of place and it's become something that it wasn't before. So what I've been doing for the past few years is really, really hit the hotel hard in the sense that they're kind of falling in line with it, and it's really good. Yeah, and I actually met with the PR department just before I came here. So I do have some swag to give out, like I mentioned. So I'll be asking a couple questions, and if you get it right, hopefully, um, I can get some stuff away, right? So, any other questions? Oh, right here. Three. Oh, right here. Um, you talked about salt. Yes. So should we take our... Morton salt shaker out and put that where we see slugs and snails. You can do that too. Yes. Instead of using the. You can do that as well. Yes. There's a manual. A golf golf clubs are great too. Those are awesome for snails. They're, I mean, they smell and they. But you know, it, it's really cool. You don't got to They don't go to the neighbor's yard or nothing. But it's that's a really good organic way. To, and any like seriously, anything organic is great. I go collecting with my hands and go wash my hands after. And you know, you can put them inside salt or. I hate to say this, beer, and people are like, oh, that's, you, don't, you don't waste beer. Uh, but you can see, yeah, I heard that. Um, but you can seriously set out a plate of beer at night, and that's, they'll, they'll come up to it, and they'll get in that beer, and the salt will kill them. So, yeah, copper, copper wire, like if you have a raised planter box, do stripped copper wire, copper flashing around that whole box when they try to come up, they hit the copper and they leave. So there's ways to protect, you know what I mean? You don't necessarily have to kill. But, but manual removal is great. I mean, or if you want to go out and salt each one of them, give them, you know, let your grandkid or ever go out and here, salt, we'll go. have fun with it. <laughs> so then I'm not sure if it's rust or what, but like primaria trees and yes. the trees, they get this. That is a fungus. And what should we do? Um, you can apply, like I said, neem oil is a great fungicide. So you can apply a neem oil to it. Now, rust will run its course and then your plant will defoliate and it'll come back during the next season. That's literally why plumerias drop their leaf because of plumeria rust. Uh, they can't sustain it all year long so they shed their leaves during the winter because that's when they're their weakest. They're not producing, they're not growing. That's when things come in and attack them during the winter time. So most plumerias, they go naked. So they don't have anything for the bugs to bother, right? So that's one good thing is you just let those let natural attrition go away, but clean up that material, bag it, throw it away so you don't have those spores continuing to grow in your yard. You know, it's maintenance, yeah. My last question, I went to the, um, oh, the Ritz-Carlton a couple of years ago, and they had a chef's tour out there in that garden. He showed all the um, herbs and uh, yeah. we all got to taste the basil or the whatever as we walked around. Do you at the Weston maybe have a garden tour where you could have a public? We are actually. You could um, show the people who could come and. So, to get to that, I've got basically another six months of construction. Six months more of construction going on at my hotel. Then after that, we are developing a really, really nice Hawaiian garden tour. That's part of the projects I'm part of. We're going to bring in some rare stuff from Martha's and plant them right there in that area. And it kind of emulates what happens back in the back of actual Honokawai Valley. I've been way back there with TNC and seen all the cool stuff that's back there. So we're trying to emulate that in one of our 
big slopes so we can plant it out and make it look like the back of Honokawai. So yes, we will be doing that soon. We used to have a garden tour. I was one of the only ones offering a free botanical tour for many years through the Westin. And since we went under construction, we had to kind of stop it because areas get cordoned off and also walls go up and now we can't take the tour that way. You gotta go this way. And so yeah, we're just holding off until we get complete. But yes, we will be building a tour. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? All right, good. Now I get to ask questions. Oh wait, all right, fine. All right, what you got? I believe it's Jack. I believe it's Japanese beetles on uh, grapes and rose. Yeah, yeah. Lights. Mm -hmm. Our best organic way is Christmas lights. Lights run them right through your garden. Rope lights, solar lights, whatever you can do to make that bug not come out. It wants to come out at night. Don't let it be night. All around it, all, they come from the soil and they go up into the plant. So if you can mimic that light around your garden, um, old thing that, that I learned from a Japanese lady in, in McKenna, she just takes the old school plastic rope light and just runs it through the roses. Just run, and at night it turns on. And it's all on the ground. It looks cool too. You're like, oh, that's really neat. But it's actually serving a purpose. Yeah. And there's also things called uh, BT. I think it's Bercillus thumbergis. It's a, a type of fungus that the bug ingests and then the mushroom grows within that bug. And that's a great one for beetles, moths, larvae, things like that. Turns it into a mushroom. Really, I mean, BT is a GMO. They, they put BT in papayas. It's a, it's a, they put BT into the DNA of certain papayas as a GMO, and when these things are attacked, these bugs turn into mushrooms. That's how it works. So, but that's, that's the mechanism of it. But BT, is a, you can get that around. It's a pretty, um, the dipel, but it's not organic. I mean, there are organics you can get that are um, BT, but dipel's not. Anything growing, I mean, just glow. They just, they don't, they, they don't want, they think it's daylight and they don't come out. They just, you're just trying to mimic daylight and that's gonna stop them, yeah. All right, so, all right, so let's see. I think I have some stuff back here. All right, so, all right, so who can tell me what NPK stands for? You have to tell me all three. And you get this cool little like neoprene bag that has this like really cool bamboo set of utensils inside. All right, so we got a hand, wait, okay. All right. NPK, it's easy. We have a winner, all right, that's what I'm talking about. All right, yeah, I'm gonna run that up to her. All right, cool, all right. All right, so what's the Hawaiian name for Black Rock in Kanapali? If you don't answer it, I get to keep it. Who knows it? I swear I heard it. Oh, well, thank you. We have a winner right there. Pu'uke Ka'a. Okay, so Pu'uke Ka'a is where a lot of people in Lahaina lived originally, and Honokawai Valley had 600 residents that fed the 6,000 people that lived down there. So just in Honokawai Valley produced that much food. Sustainable, non-imported. So where are we at today, right? Holy cow. All right, so I got another one. Ooh, all right, so let's see what. That's another good one. Um... Who can name the rarest plant here on Maui? No. It's, I'll give you a hint. It's named after a Hawaiian god that we're actually speaking of right now. That, that's why I'm here. The, yeah, who's the god of the ocean? Anybody know the god of the ocean? Who? No. <laughs> <laughs> anybody, anybody? All right, all right, okay, who's that? Kanaloa? Who said it? Oh, okay, wait, okay, wait, hold on, wait, hold on. That's gotta, all right, who, who really said it first? You gotta have to Rochambeau. <laughs> all right, so whoever said Kanaloa? So Kanaloa is a species that grew on, on Kaholave. Um, this plant was really beautiful. The seed looks like a polished koa heart. Imagine how beautiful the lay would be of that, right? But when you only find two seeds on one existing plant in the wild, what do you do with those two seeds? You, you, you don't make a lay, okay? Uh, <laughs> you take those seeds and you grow them. And we actually have one at Maui Nui Botanical Gardens, and we have one out in Haiku. And there's only two in the entire world. 
and they're the ones at Maui Nui and in Haiku. The father plant passed away about a year ago on Kaholave. So it is now extinct in the wild, and we have two over here. So pretty interesting. So, all right. Yeah, pretty cool working with all these crazy people. All right, so um, <clears throat> let's see. I got another one here. We have a few of these to give away, right? So kind of neat little things. Sorry, my kukui nuts are banging the things. Um, let's see, what's a good question? Uh, oh, what's the technical term for muddy water? Who said that? All right, so we have a whoever said turbidity, who said turbidity? Oh, the cameraman. <laughs> good job. <laughs> so, so you mean it's not doo doo water? Not doo doo water, nope. Turbidity, turbidness. And yeah, it's all those lovely brown water advisors we get, right? Yeah, so. Let's see what else. Um, oh. No, that would be a good one. Um, okay. What is the area above the Lahaina wind farm called? Okay, Polly means cliff. That's the highway. That's close, but not quite. Yes. It also, I'll, I'll give you the Hawaii. I'll give you the English translation. It means where the sun gives birth. Can you say that in Hawaiian? Cool. I get to keep this one. It's, <laughs> it's called. Hanaula, because you know what Hanau is, right? Hanau is to give birth, and La is the god, so Hanaula. And that is the top of West Maui Mountains on this end, because that's where the sun comes right over Haleakala and gives birth. So that's Hanaula. So, anyway, this is mine, thank you. All right, cool. <laughs> I, I wanted to keep one, I really did. I decided to you know, question answer thing, you know. Um, all right, so what is a good organic alternative to Roundup? No, I need a hand. Nope, not neem. Oh, wait, what now? Big hand, big hand. Somebody throw up a hand. Scythe, thank you. Winner. <laughs> you have to throw your hand up and say the answer at the same time. All right, so let's see. I think I have a few more. Oh. All right, cool. Oh, well, yeah, they get to hand those out later then. Some of you guys got to speed up. I don't know which one. Let's see. All right, we've got a couple more here. Only a few more, and then, um, and then we're going to end this thing up here. All right, let's see, what else can we do here? What is, what's a good one about Ma'alaya? Oh, I just said it, never mind. Um, <laughs> all right, it happens sometimes, you say the punchline before the joke. Uh, let's see, uh, okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> what weather event named the area over here that's just north of McKenna Wailea? A weather event. That's the name of a certain area that a lot of people lived in the first time they moved here. And I'm sure some people live in now. Hands up. All right, we have a winner in the back. All right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Sorry, that was my daughter. Um, yeah, that, that's Isabella back there. Um, but no, uh, a lot of the areas here are named after weather events. Um, Kula is basically the breadbasket that's named Kula because it provides so much, right? Kihei is named after a weather event that is a long cloud that covers the, right along the coast. That happened, I've seen it maybe twice in the 25 years I've been here, that cloud that sits right on the coastline. And it's a perfect rectangular cloud that sits right over Kihei. And that's why that was named Kihei, because of the Cape Cloud. And then at McKenna, it turns and goes all the way out, like an umbilical cord, all the way out to Kaolave. And that's what would feed Kaolave. Yeah, so that's right there at Ulapalakua, yeah. All right, so, um, let's see. What agronomist brought the first mangoes to Hawaii? Yeah. Oh, we got a winner. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, so, sorry, that was kind of a cheater. He was with me at Flinning Arboretum a couple months ago. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so. Anyway. Um, let's see. Actually, I'm just going to give this one to the guy in the back because he had the answer too. So, here you go. Right here. Raise your hand. You had the answer? Yep. Yeah, I guess I had it to him. Hey, guys, thank you very much for spending time with me. Um, I hope you learned enough, I hope. And um, just reach out to any of these guys. If you want to get a hold of me, they can, they can reach out and find me I'm, or come see me at the hotel. Come down, have lunch, come stay the night, enjoy the resort, it's safe, it's nice, it's really pretty. At my hotel that I take care of. We just went through major renovations of big areas. We have one small area that we're still working on. Uh, we actually have a, a master chef who is taking that over. We're gonna have a really nice restaurant here in about six months 
from a Gordon Ramsay master chef. So it's really, really cool. So things are really popping right down there in Weston. So please come down and see me if you want. And I appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you. 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 Thank you.